I want to read a passage from uh, Isaiah chapter 40 and verse eight, familiar one. It says, the grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. And you will see the significance of that passage as we go through our lesson tonight. Just keep that in mind. There's been a lot of uh, commentary and public debate recently over the issue of political correctness. Political correctness. You may not be able to define this term, but I'm sure you have heard about or have been affected by its influence. Political correctness, or PC, as it's referred to, is an ideological movement that began in the early 90s on um, uh, American college campuses. It's uh, hard to define, but basically, basically it's an attempt to solve the problems of intolerance and bigotry in this country. That's, you know, that's the definition. Political correctness is an attempt to solve the problems of intolerance and bigotry in this country. That's what people say about it. The problem is that in an attempt to solve these problems, the PC movement has become a problem in itself. So in my lesson this evening, I'd like to review the background of this ideology and propose a Christian solution to the problems that the PC movement is trying to resolve. So a man, a writer, a blogger actually, uh, named John Millimore writes that uh, in the November 16th issue of the uh, Claremont Review of Books, a professor, uh, his name is uh, Angelo Codevilla, he wrote a very interesting article about the rise of political correctness in America. Um, professor Codvilla is a professor emeritus of international relations at Boston University. He wrote that the notion of political correctness came into use among communists in the 1930s as a semi-humorous reminder that the party, meaning the communist party, the communist party's interest was to be treated as a reality that ranks above reality itself. Stay with me here. The inside joke among party members at that time went something like this. Comrade, one would say, your statement is factually incorrect. However, it is politically correct. That's where that term initiated. This little joke, this little inside joke, was a vital reminder to Stalin's party members that to stray from the communist party line could mean death. So whether or not something was true mattered less than whether or not it advanced the Communist Party's ideology, or in other words, unless it was politically correct. And so the term to be politically correct was be meant correct according to the party doctrine. Never mind the truth, never mind reality. Reality was what the party said it was. Their reality was politically correct. So this term and approach has been appropriated by the politically progressive movement here in the United States and elsewhere in order to move their agenda forward. Political correctness is not a goal. It is not an end result as many think. It is a means to an end. Political correctness is a strategy the PC movement has a basic goal, and that is to fix what they believe is a broken society here in the United States. And if they seize control of that society, 
they will repair what is broken. The main faults, according to PC ideology, the main faults of this nation, according to them, are the following. The first is racism. And according to them, racism perpetrated mainly by white people. Secondly, sexism. And sexism perpetrated mainly by men. And thirdly, oppression. And oppression perpetrated mainly by America because its accomplishment and laws and traditions were simply a history and a product of racism, sexism, and oppression of the poor, and most recently added to that category, and immigrants. Of course, no one can deny that these problems do exist in this vast country of over 300 million people, but the PC movement believes that these are not simply problems that any society has, but rather that racism and sexism and oppression of the poor are the basis of American thinking and political policy. And their solution to this problem involves a complete change in the way that Americans think and relate to each other. And so the PC strategy has three avenues that will lead them to their goal. And the goal is control. Political correctness is a strategy in order to gain control. So what are the three avenues? Well, first, promote universal multiculturalism. In other words, PC believe that American history and culture is way too concentrated in European white history and literature. In PC thinking, re-education requires equal time for every culture represented in America today so that in the classroom students should spend equal amounts of time and resources studying uh, George Washington, a white male European descendant, spend as much time studying about him as they study the poetry of Maya Angelou, who is a black female former poet laureate. So as much time in the classroom you know, studying the poetry of Maya Angelou as uh, students study the life and times of George Washington. PC ideology would do away with the melting pot idea that when you come to America, you shed your past and you embrace the values of the USA set forth in the Constitution and the traditions of this country. In other words, you become an American. Instead, each culture would promote and develop its own ideas its own history and traditions, and America would no longer be a melting pot, but would become a quilt of many colors. So you would have African American, and Euro American, and Native American, Hispanic American, you know, always with the hyphen. Actually, this is the political philosophy of Canada. Nothing new here, and I can tell you what that has led to, having come from Canada. Second Avenue, reinvent language and law. In other words, change the language and the laws so that they will eliminate any form of racism or perceived sexism or harassment. Well, what would that mean? Well, freshmen are now called fresh persons. <laughs> Ms. Ms. instead of Miss or Mrs. Eliminate references to God as Father in the Bible. That's sexism. Some companies forbid employees from having uh, 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 or reading a Bible at work because this would be religious harassment to those who do not believe. 
and of course the support of gay rights and abortion rights because not to do so would be sexist or racist because everyone has a right to pursue their own orientation, whatever they believe that to be. And the government is there to support that and anyone who is against that is a bigot or a sexist. Now there are more examples than time, but many efforts to outlaw prayer, for example, or to initiate quotas, or even suppress di displays of patriotism is part of the strategy. Good example, the University of Maryland officials uh, at the time did not want students to fly the American flag during the Gulf War because of protest of the PC advocates because they claimed that the flag was a symbol of American racism, oppression, and sexism. And these efforts to change the law and to change how we speak and how we relate to each other are largely done through the influence of this movement that began in the 90s. And then the third, the third avenue, the redistribution of wealth. A basic concept of the PC movement is that America systematically oppresses its poor. And for this reason, a redistribution of wealth is necessary. This is why in PC terminology, a person is not poor, oh no. That's a degrading term. A person is economically exploited, ah yes. A person is economically disadvantaged, new language. PC movement goes beyond a simple concept of the haves, sharing with the have-nots. They want government to guarantee that the wealth and whoever has it is evenly distributed among everyone. Now, the battleground for these ideas are the college campuses because that's where the future writers and business leaders and politicians and social engineers will come from. And the influence of this movement is felt not only on campuses, but in larger society and government as well. Note the support of gay and abortion rights by the previous, uh, the previous administration in this country. Mr. Obama, he was the absolute poster boy for the PC movement. He embraced all of this you know, with enthusiasm, if you didn't realize that. <laughs> Note that, remember Donna Shalala? Remember her? She was the former Secretary of Health and Human Services. She was considered one of the leading exponents of the PC movements while she was the Chancellor of the University of Wisconsin. She was plucked out of there and put in charge of a large bureaucracy. So with all of this happening around us, how do we as Christians respond to this newest social and political wave? Let me suggest two very practical and effective responses that Christians can offer to the people and the influence of political correctness in our generation. So what will it be, like the title of the sermon says, you know, political correctness or Bible correctness? Well, number one, understand the motivation behind the movement. Don't get mad just because of what you hear on TV. You know, sometimes I get so upset, I just turn it off, switch the channels. This ideology and the changes that it is causing in our society stems from the frustration that some people feel in dealing with social problems that don't seem to be getting better. I mean, let's face it, discrimination does exist in this country where a person is excluded from opportunity and respect based simply on their color or their culture or their physical and intellectual limitations. Uh, we cannot deny that that exists in this country. And oppression, of course. Oppression does exist where the haves use their wealth only in the service of gaining more wealth without regard for others and their needs. 
Does that exist in the USA? Absolutely. But I don't believe, like the PC movement does, that this country was founded with the purpose of perpetuating racism and oppression. I don't believe that. However, the economic success, you know, the, the, the country was based on the idea that the economic success by, should be had by all kinds of people, not just white males that we should have political and religious freedom in this country. That the, uh, uh, the amount of foreign aid that we give in comparison to others is quite generous. And not to mention the cost of American lives to defend other nations and their freedoms. All of those things tells me that this country was founded on the principle of liberty and justice for all people not just white Anglo-Saxon males. The ideals of the founding fathers may have not been reached and the PC movement may be correct in pointing that out and we need to understand this. But to say that the original goal was to produce the evils of racism and oppression, that is to be guilty of the very thing that they condemn, and that is intolerance and hatred. <laughs> what was interesting is the big march, you know, after Mr. Trump was inaugurated, you know, took the oath of office. Remember that big march that happened the next day, that protest march, I said a million people, the women were marching and, and we were showing solidarity and blah, 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 blah. And, and, but who was not allowed to march in that march? <laughs> yeah, men. Uh, you know who else wasn't allowed to march? Pro-life people, they were not allowed to march. They were not permitted to march. Christians who openly acknowledged that they wanted to march, you know, to say to the nation, Christianity is about love, Christianity is against racism, Christianity is against, they were not allowed to march. The problem with the PC movement is that it is an overreaction to a real problem, and in doing so, it makes the same problem worse. The other thing that I might point out to you, aside from trying to understand what's actually taking place here, is to understand that the answer to the evils in society is biblical correctness, not political correctness. In every generation, man tries to find ways to solve society's problems. There are breakthroughs in science and there are breakthroughs in social engineering and there are all kinds of philosophical ideas that come and go one generation after another and the political correctness movement is just one more of these that are going by. But the way to deal with evil is to confront it with the truth of the scriptures and remain steadfast that with truth and that truth whether it seems politically correct or not, remains the truth, one generation after another. You know, the, the advocates of the PC movement are merely trying to establish their own standard in order to measure what is correct and right. The mistake with this is that they are trying to take the place of the Bible as the basic standard for what is right and for what is good. The Bible is the standard for what is right and what is good. In John chapter 12, verse 48, we read, he, Jesus says, he who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him at the last day. We use that passage obviously to, to encourage people to respond to the gospel, of course. But in this passage, Jesus is also saying, the word I spoke to you, this is what judges. Not only you personally, but this is what judges what is right, what is good, what is proper. The word I spoke to you. 
In another familiar passage, 2 Timothy 3.16, Paul says, every scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. What is that training? For knowing and doing what is right. That the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. Equipped meaning we don't need another philosophy to tell us and to explain to us what is right, what is good, what is proper, what is moral. We have it already. The Bible says of itself that it is the standard given by God that will determine what and who is right, regardless of what man says. But the PC movement is trying to change this. For example, political correctness says to oppose homosexuality is a sign of sexism and intolerance. But the Bible says, thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is an abomination, Leviticus 18.22. And then Paul says in 1 Corinthians 6, 9 and 10, homosexuals will not inherit the kingdom of God. Who are you going to believe? Another example, political correctness says that a woman has authority over her own body and a right to choose if she wishes to terminate her pregnancy or not. And anyone who opposes this is bigoted, a misogynist, sexist, whatever you want to call that person. But the Bible says that all human life is sacred because it is made in the image of God. And so this requires us to respect all people regardless of their color or their sex. Now PC people would agree with us on that point, but it also requires us to respect all those who are human but have not yet been born. You know, in the New Testament the Holy Spirit described John the Baptist while he was still inside his mother's womb with the term brepos, which is a Greek word meaning babe. In Luke 1 verses 41 to 44. The interesting thing about this word is that it is the exact Greek word that is used to describe Jesus after he had been born. Same word used to describe John while he's still in his mother's womb. Exactly the same word to describe Jesus after he has been born and come into this world, Luke chapter uh, two, verse 12. The conclusion here is that in God's eyes, both are equally human, whether still in the mother's womb or delivered into the world. Uh, that's not theology, that's grammar. <laughs> grammar. If there was an essential difference between the two, of any significant, there are plenty of Greek words that could have used another word to describe the child in the womb. The only difference between these two was in the development and the environment. And so the answer to racism and sexism and oppression is not a new language or a new distribution of power. The answer to these evils is a new heart transformed by the Spirit of Christ. A heart that the Bible says is putting to death the deeds of the flesh, like racism and greed and oppression and sexism, and putting to death these things by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 13. Not being put away by the power of a political movement, a heart that the Bible says is free from all bitterness and wrath, anger, clamor, slander, along with all malice. A heart that is kind to others, tender and forgiving. Ephesians chapter four, verse 30 and 31. I ask you a question. Was this the heart that was being demonstrated as the PC movement people were uh, 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 riding in the streets and destroying property and smashing cars and beating people up and cursing? Is that the heart? Jesus says from the heart you know, comes what you say, what you say and what you do, it comes from the heart. 
You can tell the tree by its fruit. Well, if the fruit of the tree is writing and discard of the rule of law and oppression, is this a movement we, we ought to adapt to in this country? Political correctness has produced a new language and a lot of debate that hasn't really solved the problems that it identifies. Biblical correctness, on the other hand, produces a new heart, which bears the fruit of true personal change, love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and faithfulness and self-control, which ultimately works to change society for the better. You know, 30 years ago, the issue that I might have been preaching about was the issue of the New Age movement. Remember then, the New Age movement? And my point back then would have been, you know, stick with the New Testament, because the New Age movement would ultimately be old news and fade away. Today, the buzzword is politically correct. And the message now is to stick to what is biblically correct, because with time, political correctness will show its errors and it too will fade into the closet of social issues and fads. Do, do you see a trend here? Ideas come and they go. Fads, they appear and they disappear. Movements, they rise and they fall. Now remember I told you to keep in mind the scripture? But the word of the Lord is forever. And happy are those who are faithful to it generation after generation. One last point I want to make and that is how political correctness is affecting religion. It is now politically incorrect to claim that someone may be lost because of sin. Why? Well, because there is no sin, just the results of racism, sexism, and oppression. It's also politically incorrect to suggest that one may be lost or mistaken in their religion because along with universal multiculturalism, there comes the idea of universal salvation. In other words, according to the PC movement, every religion is okay and every religion accomplishes man's salvation. Well, I mean, I take another sermon to respond to that claim. Suffice to say that if all religions are exactly the same, then none of them are worth anything. If you say otherwise to them, that there's only one God, one salvation, it is to be religiously intolerant and legalistic. But again, the Bible says, and there is no salvation in no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Acts 4.12. Apostles and disciples who preached this in the first century were also politically incorrect and they were killed for their effort. Thank you very much. Being biblically correct produces new hearts and new attitudes for those who believe, but for those who do not believe, biblical correctness is, as Paul says, the aroma of death for those who reject it. 2 Corinthians 2.15. Christians who preach the gospel of Christ as the only way of salvation have always been politically incorrect and will always be so. So don't be surprised at the opposition and do not back down because of it. You know, God searches the earth for those who hunger and thirst to be right with Him. And to these He promises satisfaction. Never mind political correctness, it will not make you right with God and its success to make you right with yourself or your neighbor or your society, this is doubtful at best. I go back, remember I mentioned John Millimore? Fine, fine article that he wrote. I want to quote some from him. It says, the method the communists and progressives differ, 
But the goal is one and the same, achieve cultural hegemony. Cultural hegemony, hegemony means control, domination, all right? He says, progressives learned that achieving hegemony by criminal punishment, such as prison and torture and the gulags, Achieving you know, domination through this method is difficult and expensive. Intellectuals seeking to remake America, born tainted by Western civilization's original sins that they claim, racism, sexism, greed, genocide, the progressives found a much better way to take care of these people. Political correctness, he says, perpetuated by a small class of people is ensconced at universities and bureaucracies and major media is the ideal tool for achieving cultural domination. It is what he calls forceful seduction. It achieves tacit collaboration by millions who simply bite their lip, meaning they say nothing out of the fear of being accused of racism or sexism. How many people, and again, I don't mean to get quote political here, how many people who uh, were sympathetic to Mr. Trump and his campaign and would uh, you know, vote, how many of those people do you think didn't put a sign in their front lawn because they were afraid of getting blowback from their neighbors or, yeah, that's how political correctness works. That's what he's talking about here. Tacit collaboration by millions of people who simply bite their lip and say nothing. As a political philosophy, political correctness might seem lifeless and aimless, but Codvilla noted the goal of Lenin and Stalin was not a state built on Marxist principles, it was always party control. <laughs> the two philosophies are similarly empty, meaning Marxism and political correctness. Again, I quote, like its European kin, all that American progressivism offers is obedience to the ruling class enforced by political correctness. Nor is there any end point to what is politically correct any more than there were ever to communism. Here and now, as everywhere and always, it comes down to glorifying the party and humbling everybody else. The social justice people are always on the side of compassion and victims' rights. So objecting to anything that they do makes you instantly a perpetrator. There's no place that you can stand without being vilified. And that's why it continues to creep forward. And that's why it continues to creep forward, because too many people just bite their lip. Who knows? PC ideology may ruin this country after all. I don't know, I, can tell the, I can't tell the future. I certainly hope not. But I can guarantee, however, that it cannot and will not destroy or control the church of Christ. That I know. What does Jesus say? I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. Just take out the gates of Hades and leave a blank there and just fill in whatever you want to fill in depending on what you know, century you're living in. And Nazism will not destroy it. Communism will not destroy it. Materialism will not destroy it. Political correctness will not destroy it. If the devil and hell cannot destroy the church, we can feel confident that this latest in a long line of failed movements will not be able to as well. Our task in this loud and noisy social time is to be on the alert and to stand firm in the faith and act like men and be strong. Let all that you do, Paul says, be done in love. In other words, he's saying not just to the males, he's saying to the church, stand up, 
Be a man. Stop whining. Stop being afraid. In every generation, there's going to be someone that wants to shut you up or shut you down. If we do this, if we stand up, we will be biblically correct. And this type of correctness is pleasing to God, no matter what man tries to accuse us of. In closing, let me just say that if we are not correct with God, because this whole lesson was about replacing political correctness with biblical correctness, and I've been assuming that we're all correct with God, we're okay with Him, but in the event that someone may not be correct with God, well then there is a change that is necessary. Whether the change is from you know, disbelief and disobedience to faith and obedience, through repentance and baptism, if, if that's the change that is rec rec required, don't be afraid to do that because that is biblically correct. Or perhaps the change is a necessary change in direction or a change in commitment expressed in a desire to be restored through the prayer, uh, prayers of the church. That impulse, that also, you can act on that impulse because that's biblically correct, biblically correct as well. So John, I'm going to ask you to get your song ready, and I encourage anyone uh, that requires to be correct or right with God, whether it be through conversion and baptism or through the prayers of the church, the elders are here tonight, ready to pray for you and take your good confession of faith. Whatever type of ministry you might need, please come now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.